Okay, so I'm going to remind you all of Dolores Cannon. Uh, she was a professional hypnotist and she specialized in regressing different people to the same place. And that place was where she could have a continuous conversation through, uh, let's go with thousands of different individual humans. Is this weird or what? Dolores Cannon, the hypnotist. Let me explain it again. She was a hypnotist and she had an office. And people would come to the office for, let's say, an hour. And Dolores would uh, first uh, hypnotize them. And then um, whatever they had wanted to do. Maybe they wanted to stop smoking. Hypnotists, they usually are stop smoking, stop gambling is quite uh, frequently what they do. And then the other one that people hear about is a hypnotic regression. I want to know what my past lives were. Was I Cleopatra? So uh, it's very easy for a hypnotist to guide you into so-called past lives. Anyways, um, Dolores at one point connected with a certain let's call it a voice, and this voice was telling Dolores the true state of nature here on planet Earth. And it's very different than the um, description of reality that we get from um, our friends and family. Dolores said that, um, well, the one that I want to really get to is she said there are what are known as background people in our lives. What's a background person? Well, you could go and listen to Dolores talk about uh, what she heard directly from the voice. Otherwise, you're getting it secondhand from me. So I'm going to recommend that you go onto YouTube, uh, just do a search for Dolores Cannon. C O Cannon C A N N O N Dolores D E L O R E S Dolores Cannon and then put in backdrop people because that's what she called them backdrop people and uh, I'll just summarize what I got out of it uh, some humans that look human to you aren't are we living in... The, it's like Jumanji. Have you seen the Jumanji movie where the uh, humans get um, um, beamed into a, a, a Jumanji video game? And in, a, in any video game, you are and your friends are active players and then there's some computer-generated characters. The computer-generated characters... Especially if they're just doing a very small thing. Like you go to a bar and there's a bartender. And you go uh, up, to, you move your character up to the bar and you say, um, I want a beer. The bartender says, thank you, turns around and um, pulls a beer on the tap for example, gives you the beer, says, here's your beer, sir, that will be $5. You give the bartender $5, and uh, he looks at you like, and then you um, reach in your pocket, and you pull out a $2 coin and give it to the bartender. He smiles and says, thank you very much, sir. Then you wander away back to um, some other people. Now, that just seems like a normal human being a bartender to you. But in a video game, that one could be a computer-generated character. It's very simple. Simple artificial intelligence for this character. This character... What if you're sitting at the restaurant with someone, you're having a conversation, and uh, there's, there's like 12 tables around you in the restaurant with people sitting at them. You never talk to these people. 
These people could be backdrop characters. So what's the difference between you and backdrop characters? Well, let's say in like in that movie Jumanji, I think there was about six people who got beamed up into the Jumanji game. So there's six real people in the Jumanji game and everyone else in the Jumanji game is a computer generated character or a backdrop character. Now that's a Jumanji movie. Very cute. But if I'm going to tell you, this is what Dolores Cannon says actually happens in our reality. Dolores Cannon, who interviewed, according to her, I mean, I never met Dolores Cannon. Apparently she's dead. She's a video character. And if you go on to um, the online bookstore and look up Dolores Cannon, uh, she had like books called like the convoluted universe bunch of books and you could read her books to see what she says about all the information she got from hypnotizing different humans and then getting through to the same person now she was talking to me I'm hypnotized and I'm telling her something and then uh, the person after me in her next appointment shows up it's a woman she sits down on Dolores's couch and Dolores hypnotizes her and then Dolores immediately brings her back to the same person that she was talking to when I was hypnotized. And she did this for thousands of people she sh so she could give a continuous stream of questions to the same um, so-called person that the hypnotized human was giving them. So if that's going on in our reality, well then there's certain people in your life who are backdrop people. And maybe they're good for you for giving you a beer, or maybe they're good for you for being insufficient to do anything other than a specific task in your Jumanji game. And at the end of the Jumanji game, This is the interesting one because, it, it, you know, in the old school games that we played on computers, a desktop computer, and we loaded up uh, Microsoft Windows, and then we would load up a game like Quake, which was a first person shooter game. And in the end, um, when we were done playing for, we, we, we could either pause the game and leave the computer on, or we could uh, just turn the game off and um, turn off the computer till the next time you want to play. But in this particular game called Planet Earth, maybe... Like in Jumanji, you had to win. Your team had to win something in the Jumanji world in order for you to exit the game and go back to where you first entered the game, which is next to the table with the video game console with the cartridge called Jumanji. But what if in Earth world, you um, agreed to come to Earth and then once you got here, then you ran into lots of troubles. And then you realized, hey, maybe this world is a lot like Jumanji and I'm playing it wrong. And you're trying to figure out, well, what did we learn from playing Jumanji or watching the Jumanji movie and how we could apply it to our lives right here? And the answer is, I don't know if that's I don't think it's wise because the Jumanji thing was very kind of contrived I mean having um, I don't know 5,000 um, ostriches chase you down to a um, a canyon wall where you've got to uh, you've got to jump the canyon wall somehow it just doesn't seem to be playing that way for me it's not like a Jumanji game it's definitely a game though where certain people appear to be a little bit cardboard characters you know the ones if you were going to think okay backdrop people are just not going to 
they're just not going to be as smart as real people or they're going to they're program them to be super smart they're going to have like um, you know someone is going to come in and they're going to be so smart they're going to be as smart as uh, Albert Einstein and they're going to be working at my McDonald's taking my order you know, I'm going to be ordering like a milkshake and fries and a muffin and a coffee. And the person behind the till, it's a blonde girl and she she's in, she's 17 years old. And um, she looks like she came from a movie like where they were wearing blue dresses with white aprons. But she's changed into a McDonald's uniform. And... Um, This person asks me, why are you here? And I said, uh, I'm hungry. And the girl says, you're not supposed to be here. You're supposed to be in another venue. In other words, Jumanji's up and you're supposed to go to the next station. And you're still here. You're stuck in this Jumanji game. And we're going to call it, change it to, you're stuck in this earth game and you keep wondering, why wasn't I issued like an owner's manual or something? It's too hard to figure out what to do in earth. So then you go to Dolores Cannon and she's giving you all this kind of information, like things are not as they seem. And this is weird, 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 weird. Does it explain the weirdness of your own life? Dolores Cannon. No, no, not at all. And I read, I, I downloaded some of free samples of her book. I think it could have been the Comedy Looted Universe or one, some of his other ones. One, some of her other ones. And I found some of the answers to some of the questions asinine. The voice she was talking to when these people were hypnotized sometimes gave her the most ridiculously stupid, impossible answers. To make you think, you know, whoever this voice is, it's not a voice that really knows anything at all. It's a voice who's like stringing you along, Dolores. You've got all these fantasies going on in your head. Fantasy programs, Dolores. And one of the fantasy uh, programs that Dolores has running as a program that she doesn't even know is We're Here to Save the Earth Fantasy. A lot of people have this program going, this fantasy that you are here to change the earth. No. In fact, Dr. Hawkins of Consciousness Research said that, basically that, that earth is a purgatorial planet, which is like a Catholic, Roman Catholic word for a place you go after you die. It's a waiting room. You're not in heaven. It's a waiting room. Purgatory. And, you know, people, like the, the church people say, well, you know, you're here, and then when you die, uh, you go to purgatory. Pretty much, they don't say, I, I'm not Catholic, but pretty much they say, uh, you go to purgatory is the next step on your journey, the soul's journey, after you would die here on planet Earth. But Dr. Hawkins of Consciousness Research found out that actually Earth, where we are now, this is a purgatorial realm. And then if you go to like Aaron Abke, who talks about the law of one and the densities of souls, this particular density of souls is set up for you to become a, a polarity in the law of one terminology. Uh, the polarities are service to others or service to self. And a planet like Earth is where you choose one or the other ways. According to the law of one stuff, and, you know, am I expert on it? I've heard of quite a few lectures on it. I mean, you can always be more expert and you can track me down, you know, looking and trying to figure out how I'm wrong and explaining this. And in the end, good luck. But uh, the idea is this is a... Um, a certain density planet where souls come here and in the law of one teachings 
which is the story about how you can classify um, different civilizations, let's say, on different planets throughout the galaxy. And if you're going to become an advanced soul, quite likely you're going to be in... Um, Well, it's just that they have densities. And when you go to these higher densities in their system, I believe, if I've got it right, the souls that are in these particular realms are uh, more advanced than us here on planet Earth. So more advanced, the way I would look at it, would be um, higher level on the scale of human consciousness. So you can look up the scale of human consciousness, and you can uh, see. Well, Dr. Hawkins, when you know when he was still alive, um, he's um, humanity had only got to about 203 on the scale by 1987. That's after thousands of years of humans um, evolving in the human form. Human history is nothing but negativity in the scale of consciousness, which is anything lower than 200 on the scale. So, you know, maybe there's planets, well, according to the Law of One, there are places, let's call them planets, where um, humans like us, hang on, crap coming out of my mouth, implants or something. Okay, so uh, at the higher levels of consciousness, uh, then these people uh, can go to different planets where there's more people of higher consciousness than here. They've already chosen their polarity. And then they go um, live their life, um, and it's not as difficult as planet Earth. Because uh, you're not needing all of the horrible, horrible that you experience here in a planet that you call purgatory. How do you get to heaven then? You need to go to the celestial realms. And in the celestial realms, uh, if you remember in Lord of the Rings, I think a celestial realm example would be the land of the elves. Even the hobbits, who were very jovial, and, but they had a lot of backbiting going on in the families. The, the, even the hobbits, uh, when they went to like Rivendell, uh, they felt uplifted just being there. Because the quality of consciousness was so much higher. And there was more magic going on there because of their higher consciousness. And it was more beautiful. And they just felt better there. The vibe was better. And that's coming from Hobbit's Land, which, you know, was when we saw it in the movies, it was a very beautiful place. So, returning to Dolores Cannon, one of the other things she told us, and it's made the rounds in the so-called spiritual community, starseed community, lightworker community, the story is that Dolores Cannon told that there were three waves of volunteer souls 
that came to Earth after World War II, after the first dropping of the nuclear bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Japan. And um, apparently the planet, whose girly name is Gaia, Gaia sent out a telepathic call to the rest of the universe saying, I'm in trouble. Because two nuclear bombs were set up were set up to go off by two different um, bombs owned by the United States dropped on Japan. And um, Gaia says, uh, so I sent out a call to the universe saying, I need souls to come and incarnate as human beings. Because the current level of human beings have sunk to such a low level of consciousness, they are capable now of blowing up the whole planet. Technologically. And this is like looking at killing me, planet Earth. And that was what we were told. By the 1950s, the United States of America and the Soviet Union had developed thermonuclear bombs that they were so worried about, they still tested them, but they had like the Zara Bomba. The Zara, Zara Bomba was the mother of all thermonuclear bombs, and the Russians, or the Soviet Union, as they were called then, um, we were told that they launched a rocket up way up in the sky way up in the, I don't know how many a um, huge elevation and it was the biggest bomb ever exploded by man on planet earth and there was worries that bombs like this could blow the whole atmosphere off the planet because they were becoming so unbelievably explosive no more air on planet earth Ergo, everything on planet Earth is dead. So planet Earth was, um, Gaia, was totally serious, uh, telling the universe, uh, I'm facing extinction, me, this whole planet. And she looked next door to us, and she pointed at the asteroid belt. You've heard of the asteroid belt? Well, the, the asteroid belt that circles planet Earth... Uh, some tales are that it is a blown up planet. A whole planet was blown up by, you know, people. So she was saying, um, the rest of the universe, it's basically, I'm fit, look, look at that, that's where I'm headed. I need help. So uh, she said, I need advanced souls with high consciousness, on the scale of human consciousness, very high. I need these people to incarnate, in other words, become human babies, so that we can get uh, the consciousness level of the human population way up. Way up. We don't want to have any more blow-ups. No, uh, no more nuclear bombs. No more bombs. No more wars. No more pollution, no more greed, no more, no more sickness, no more disease, no more evil. And she said, um, you know, this is the plan. So um, souls organize themselves and they, uh, the way Dolores Cannon tells the story, there were three waves of volunteer souls that came in and the waves would have been the first children born after the nuclear bombs went off you know that first uh, so the nuclear bombs were we're told went off in 1940 uh, i think it was 1945 so say starting in like 19 uh, 1946 some souls were incarnating as human children on planet Earth. And that went on for, let's say, from 1946 to 1960. 1960. That's one wave of volunteer souls that are um, they have to grow up in, in, as human babies. And then after that, then there was a second wave starting in like 1961. A second wave of volunteers that were in this new time period. And then following that generation, then another wave, another group. 
three waves of volunteers that bring us to, not quite now, because Dolores Cannon, um, she made these videos, uh, uh, I don't know, let's say less than, let's go 10 years ago. So, I mean, we've advanced in time since that time. So, uh, where does it stand? Well, the idea was um, it was going to be a very difficult mission because if you became a human baby, you're not going to remember who you were before you became a human baby. As best as we can figure it out. Maybe some babies did remember, but not me. I don't remember past lives. Uh, but the story is that uh, you would have to um, grow up as a normal human child into a normal human adulthood and somehow because your soul carries the right residual consciousness of your previous life from some other more advanced civilization somehow that consciousness would force its way into you as a human and it would um, force you to change and become a tool of your primary mission to planet Earth to raise the consciousness so we change the systems of control on planet Earth we change the way we have rich and poor on planet Earth we promote uh, the thriving of each individual human freedom from economic slavery and advanced human topics Dolores Cannon uh, when I read her she said that in the first wave of volunteers the first wave um, they couldn't handle the mission it was way too hard um, they were uh, becoming suicidal in other words they couldn't stand living on planet earth it was so horrible for them that they were suicidal and the other thing would have been uh, oh, they avoided other people they would they would lock themselves away um, way far away from other humans because they they couldn't handle other humans and that was the first wave so um, the second wave she didn't uh, I, did, I think they had a slightly easier time than the first wave but um, who am I to judge and then um, I don't know we heard you know, I don't know, maybe it was 20 years ago, about indigo children and crystal children. Maybe that was the third wave of volunteers. I don't know. Maybe it was um, some similar idea that advanced souls were being born now as children. What proportion of people that incarnated in 1963 were these advanced souls that chose to incarnate here into Mission Earth? The answer is, I don't know. I can't. I was going to muscle. Te I tried to muscle test to get an answer. Uh, anyway, the answer is, I don't know what percentage of uh, souls coming here. But you could try muscle testing to see if you get the answer. And if you want to know about muscle testing, um, you could get one of those Dr. Hawkins books because there's always an appendix that explains muscle testing. Or you might be able to find a, a video somewhere. But anyways, um, Dr. David R. Hawkins. David R. Hawkins. And you could get Transcending the Levels of Consciousness. It's one of the, if you're only going to get one of his books, that's probably a good one to get. If you have any questions, please put them down in the comment section below. Thank you for watching. My name is Mary Had a Little Damage.